Mary Lou Jepson is the founder of Open Water. She creates bold visions of the future. She invents novel hardware and software systems on the hairy edge of what the physics will do, builds the team and the product, and delivers it this to the mass production. She's acclaimed for her work at Google X, Facebook, Oculus, and One Laptop Per Child in consumer electronics, computers, TV, VR, wearables, healthcare, and software. Her inventions are primarily in optoelectronics and systems, and in the last five years alone, over 100 of her patents were published. Mary Lou has been recognized and should be recognized with many awards, including Time Magazine's Time 100 as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, a CNN top 10 thinker, and the leading global professional societies in optics, display, and electronics. She always dazzles us with the content of her presentation, and today there's going to be something happening here. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you. I need this. Thanks for having me. So. Uh, I feel strange here. I'm kind of crashing. I thank Lisa for inviting me. I'm a media labber. Um, I was a student at the media lab at, here at MIT in the 80s and came back as a professor in the early 2000s. And it's always great to be here, see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, but I'm kind of new to this. What I really do is consumer electronics. So I'm coming at this from a different angle than the rest of you, saying, you know, how do we build better tools we're at the end of something, I think, in some of the ways that we're using for sensing, not, of course, like Nathan's fantastic presentation on what he's doing with EEG and some of the other people. That obviously, clearly, a lot of stuff happening in genetics and in blood. But from where I sit, not much has happened in medical imaging in a long time, like decades. And so what I've been, I've been noodling on for over a decade is how do we take the functionality of one of these multi-million dollar MRI machines and turn it into a consumer electronics wearable at a thousand times lower cost with better resolution and enable it to read and write our bodies and our brains. We saw Philip talk earlier about some of Jack Gallant's work. Um, if I throw you in an MRI scanner for an hour, I can tell you if you've got a tumor or something. If I do it for 100 hours or 1,000 hours, I can tell you what words you're about to say, what images are in, are in your head, whether you're going to be suicidal or not, and all kinds of different things, as has been shown by great neuroscientists for the last decade, using graduate students as lab rats laying in these MRI scanners for hundreds or thousands of hours watching YouTube videos or listening to podcasts. So that, that, that's, I mentioned I do consumer electronics. That's not going to go mainstream for telepathy anytime soon because it's actually not that fun to lay in an MRI scanner. And they're super expensive. It's $16,000 where I live in San Francisco for an fMRI scan. So that sort of doesn't scale. So what we're trying to do at Open Water, and this is an experiment, I was recently the head of a, a large part of advanced consumer electronics at Facebook. Prior to that, I had a similar role to that at Google. And I noticed some trends happening in the process development for advanced consumer electronics in the trillion dollar manufacturing structure in Asia where I live and breathe. So I've shipped billions of dollars worth of consumer electronics over my multi-decade career on the hairy edge of the optical physics that all go into high volume mass production. And what I saw was different things happening in the fab. Um, camera chip development in the near infrared with high quantum efficiency, and I'll talk about what that means. Ultrasonic chip development. And I thought that every single brain cell in consumer electronics was finally focused on something um, pioneered here at the Media Lab in the, in the 80s virtual reality and augmented reality. And that was great, great, it was covered. Or autonomous driving, which was also super cool, but I thought everybody was missing the simple fact that our body is translucent to X-rays, to gamma rays, to huge magnetic fields, but also lowly red light. And so, um, actually let me go back, and so, this is red light, and if we can turn down the lights, I can show you what I mean. This is red light. It's going right through my hand. 
X-rays do that, but lowly red light. And given what was happening in the silicon factories that I live and breathe in, I thought we could use this property to see in high resolution inside of our bodies and our brains. And as it turns out, um, we can also make that go in reverse. I'm going to explain to you a little bit how and why that's important. Two-thirds of humanity lacks access to medical imaging. We're the lucky ones who can get an MRI scan. However, you can't get one every week. You can't um, see how your cancer, or how your brain is changing in time. There's a lot of blood tests being developed that we've heard about today. But what if you could just scan your brain with it, put on a ski hat, or like dump the images in your brain out to the computer or the words or whatever you wanted to do? What could you do with that? Um, even people are using fMRI to dump their dreams out. This is a group in Japan who has actually uh, graduate students laying in MRI machi machi machines and then waking them up right when they go into, into dreams and then correlating what they say they were dreaming about with a scan pattern is, is rather painful. But with that, extracting um, with a neural net and back propagation with new dreams, guessing or inferring what the student is dreaming. So can you imagine being able to dump your dreams to video? It would be amazing. So um, I started this company uh, about two years ago, a little bit more, and was really curious about what the limits of this new technology would, um, that I'm going to explain to you how it works in a moment. But I just thought, could we match fMRI? That was the goal, just match the resolution. But I thought, you know, what a, I convinced my investors to sort of not focus on minimally viable product and go to market and the rest of it. And like, what are the limits? What can we do? And it turns out six inches depth and a few microns. So that's like a billion times higher <laughs> than MRI. A billion, you could say it's millimeter for MRI, but that's, um, if you go a thousand times smaller, that sounds like a thousand times, but that's an X, Y, and Z. So that's a thousand times a thousand times a thousand, which is pretty astonishing. And if you couple that with the fact that you can both read and write neuron states with infrared light, as it's been shown, for example, in these papers, we could conceivably read and write neurons with this technology. Obviously, you can also add in optogenetics and, and other modalities, but we were like, whoa, this is, this is super cool. So how's all this work? Principle one, our bodies are translucent to near-infrared light. And I'm going to show you, I've got some, I, I had to rush out and miss a couple talks as I went to uh, the Trader Joe's around here, and I got some chicken. And I implanted a tumor in one of these chicken breasts. So you could see, can everybody see the tumor in the chicken breast? So chicken has approximately the same optical properties as real human flesh. And the tumor that I implanted in it has the same optical properties as a real tumor. So yeah, using red or near infrared light. I'm not using near infrared light, even though it's better, because you can't see it. Our bodies see visible light, so I'm showing you this with visible light. So, you know, unless I gave you infrared goggles. But I have another piece of chicken on, because I've been cheating a little bit. When I throw that piece of chicken on, you can no longer see the tumor. That's because the light gets scattered by the flesh. So to be able to use red light and near infrared light to see in high resolution through our bodies, we have to do something about the scatter we have to descatter the light. And so that's the next key. So it turns out, there's a reason I started this company. Um, I spent the first 10 years of my career doing holography, which enables the descattering of light. In this very building, built the world's first holographic video system with a team of graduate students, not to date myself, but in 1989. And holography captures all of the light, all of the rays, all of the wave fronts coming from every angle at every position all at the same time. It's really not just these kinds of things or an eyeball keychain that holography enabled. It was Dennis Gabor who invented the concept of holography and won the Nobel Prize for it in the early 70s, did it as an information theory thing by capturing the phase, the waves and the wavelengths of light interfering. You can construct, reconstruct the entire wave front. 
And that includes if we capture the scattering of our bodies. We can then descatter the light with holography. So holography really hasn't been possible in the form of video, except the sort of subclass that we started in this building all those years ago, mostly because we haven't had pixels in cameras and displays that are the size of the wavelength of light, so we can record the wavelength of light. But guess what? For the last five years, every single person in this room that has a smartphone has had one micron pixels in their cameras. Now, there's red, green, and blue color filters over them. They're not optimized for the IR, but that's a detail. And in fact, there's IR cameras that shipped, you know, that I don't know if people saw the iPhone announcement two weeks ago. There's an IR camera in there with approximately one micron pixel. So here's, here's how the descattering works. Here's, I mean, the scattering first. These marbles, imagine they're sort of like photons, and they're getting scattered by these barriers. And that's a bit like your body scattering light. There's a scattering event, on average, every tenth of a millimeter in your body. And so by the time the marbles get to the bottom of the scattering maze, they're random and chaotic. That's essentially what you see when you see the light going through my hand. So if we record a hologram at the bottom and side of this scattering matrix, we can then bring in the marbles from below and register their position and angle such that they bounce through the scattering maze and can emerge as a straight line of marbles at the top. So we did this with 50 marbles, but then tried it with uh, this piece of optically identical brain. And basically, put a hologram in front of that brain, this is the brain, if you will, and made um, the brain lace. Turn this, did the old marble experiment, but with trillions of photons all going through this, falling in line to, uh, to, make a, to make a beam of light. So that's why I say we can make it go in reverse. We can focus light through skull and brain, because you're probably thinking, well, what about skull? I have a piece of real human skull here, just in case you're wondering, I, you can buy it online. We treat it with great respect, skullsunlimited.com. Um, seriously. <laughs> Um, so you can see the red light goes right through. Actually, I think I have a better laser here. Yeah, so, so you can see light goes through skull. Just by the way, for the optics people out there, if you remember, um, white scatters, black absorbs, bone is white, so it sort of makes sense. But um, yeah, so this works and uh, real human skull, as I said. We were able to focus, I did uh, a version of this talk live on stage at TED last April, and focus through skull and brain to a few microns live on stage, showing that we can get to this very high resolution. So, where are we at? So, circa last winter, we built this huge lab rig to sort of test the puts and takes of the system using off-the-shelf components, camera chips, ultrasonic chips, lasers, and stuff like that, to see what the limits of the physics were. And with that, um, with optically mimicking phantoms, we were able to find tumors we implanted, vasculature we implanted in the tumors, and so forth, at about 0.5 millimeter resolution. We were constrained with the depth by the a fixed focus of our ultrasonic, uh, and I'm going to explain how we use the ultrasonics in a moment. Um, but what we were really doing this for was to perfect the design. We're really chip designers, and we <laughs> ship consumer electronics. Was to perfect the design of the chips and the laser that we needed to do to um, needed to make so that we can make a portable system with MRI plus plus resolution. So, and the goal of this is to make this imaging system that can allow us to see in high resolution inside of our body uh, with a combination of uh, sort of some of the best of near-infrared and MRI, perhaps get amyloid and tau, as the previous speaker was talking about. Um, but this is the system we've built out now because uh, we've massively reduced that big lab rig. So we have a camera chip, an ultrasonic array, where we phase array, beam scan a focused ultrasound, 
and a laser that we've made ourselves. And we're just starting with live animals. And the reason we just started with live animals, we've been doing a lot of phantoms and whatever's on sale at the meat market because it's easy to do something that's dead. And that's because um, we're all alive. It's good to be alive. Um, but it means that uh, we move. We breathe, and most importantly, blood moves through our veins. And so we did studies at how fast we'd have to pulse the light in to make our hologram. And the answer to that is about 100 microseconds. We designed a laser with a one microsecond burst pulse with the coherence that we need so we can record the hologram in a microsecond. It's no problem to record a hologram in a microsecond on a digital camera or on film. In fact, Doc Edgerton, another famous MIT guy who invented the strobe light, was using microsecond strobe pulses for that bullet going through the apple or the milk drop or so forth. It's a standard so uh, length of duration for a strobe. Misha's actually pulling it off. So what we're doing right now is we're building out for an alpha kit. This will have basically replace a multi-million dollar MRI machine um, next summer. <laughs> Although I push my team a little bit hard, I think this is a little bit bulky, and we think I'm trying to get us to go for something like this that you can wrap around or you know put it in a ski hat. So literally a wearable that has the same or better resolution than an MRI machine. So that's what we're working on. And um, so I, I, you probably get like, our body's translucent to red light, the holography descatters it, but how do we raster scan out the brain and body? And so I keep mentioning this ultrasonic ping. Here's, a, here's um, these, these um, arrays of our chips that we're making, re each represented by the black circles, and they can mosaic around the whole head or body. But we send out an ultrasonic ping, and it focuses down. And when it focuses down, we shine red light in it. And we don't shine the red light first because sound is slower than light, and we want them to end up at the same place at the same time. And so the light that goes through that ultrasonic focus changes color ever so slightly. It changes the, its actual wavelength, just like the pitch of a police car siren changes as it speeds past you. It Doppler shifts. And so we use this other property of holography by, by shifting a beam that we bring in in a light guide plate underneath a neighboring camera chip, and we can do this for multiple camera chips. And we, the property of holography that we use is that only two beams of exactly the same color light can record an interference pattern. So those are those ripples. That's what holograms look like. You're recording the phase of the light, the interference of the light. And so on our camera chip, we detect those ripples over the sea of red light that's not frequency shifted. In fact, this is just for illustrations purposes. We're using infrared light. We're changing the color a little bit. I'm just representing it by orange. Obviously, it's not those colors because it's in the infrared. But yeah, so then we decode that to get the structural information about the point. And then um, we can optionally focus the light back down to that spot to deliver photodynamic therapy or the ilk. But then we go to, say, a neighboring ultrasonic chip and uh, scan out another point. And doing this, we scan out the whole, whole brain. And what we're working on is 10 to 100,000 voxels a second, which we think we can multiplex. So we do the recording in about a microsecond. And that's basically how it works. We decode the hologram, much like Rosalind Franklin decoded this iconic image of X-ray diffraction to reveal the structure of DNA for the first time. But we do that um, in a microsecond because we have modern electronics. So uh, yeah, so one of the best uh, signals is blood, and one of the ones that we're focused on for an early product. And I made up some blood backstage. Um, it's powdered, you can buy it from Amazon. And as you can see, it's, it's absorbing, actually let me shake it up so that way you can tell it's, it really is red. Um, and so you can see the blood absorbs the red light. And in contrast, I have my pound of flesh and you can see it scatters. And so this is super important because tumors have about five times the amount of blood when they metastasize as human tissue because uh, Angiogenesis is the process of 
tumors kind of stealing blood from your blood supply so they can grow, get enough blood so they can grow and try to kill you. And so that's why there's more blood in tumors. It's also pretty interesting to see where not blood is, like clogged hearts, arteries, and so forth. And we can see the color change that blood makes, whether it's carrying oxygen or not carrying oxygen, which is exactly what functional magnetic resonance imaging does, but with a two-ton magnet rather than using some camera chips and a laser and an ultrasonic thing. So that's what we're doing. Um, uh, so camera chip design, we're like drafting on what's happening in smartphones. The IR sensors that are uh, going mainstream and shipping more than a million units a day right now have upped their quantum efficiency, so that's light on the chip converting to electrons, to about 70% in the near infrared. And that's because of the push for 3D sensing at 940 nanometers to do facial recognition and ultimately augmented reality, my former life. So you can do Pokemon Go plus plus um, as, as these new apps emerge. And we're using them to see inside. So also this thing that's happened in chip uh, design is double stack chips. And so there's an imaging layer and a logic layer right below it with connections for each pixel or each row to do real-time logic decoding. The reason we can go so fast is because we can decode that hologram on that second logic chip and just pull out the information about the voxel of interest. The bottleneck in video rate camera chips isn't recording. You record in parallel. It's pulling the data off. So we interpret on chip, and we can go fast for that reason. Um, the laser we've designed with um, these microsecond pulses with the coherence we want and the wavelength that we want. We've got a couple of them. We're, we're actually in design of like five of them right now. It's cheaper than chip design development. And then um, the beacon, the ultrasonic chip that does the shifting of the light. Um, it, it used to be you'd use a piezo material and you'd cut little lines in it and fill, those, fill, those, fill them with rubber so that you could steer a beam. But now that's a standard manufacturing process in almost every MEMS factory in the world, MEMS, the microelectromechanical system. So we're drafting on that, the consumer electronics supply chain and so forth. There's some PCAP, um, uh, 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 higher intensity um, ultrasonic development that we're also using. And I, I, this guy, Neil Castle, I, was, I talked to him at, uh, I was on a panel with him He's, he runs the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. I went to visit them last month, and they're like, could we use this to, the other way to focus the ultrasound? And I'm like, well, I don't know. How much do you need? We can do about a megapascal of intensity, and that doesn't damage. It's be well below the, the, the guidelines for safety. It turns out that's all you need to sort of ablate tissue or open the blood-brain barrier or deliver um, uh, Enough, enough intensity to burst microcapsules to deliver uh, drugs or deep brain stimulation or so forth. It's just we do a, a, a megapascal dose tops for a microsecond, but if we just leave it on for 15 seconds, we can like do surgery without a knife with the same system, which surprised us. So, you know, that, that is enabled as well with this system. So, Mostly people ask about scan speed. Um, we look, it looks like with a single system, 100,000 frames per second in reach, and then multiplexing it, although you can multiplex it with different colors and different, a lot of your usual tricks on that. How deep, so far we've done six inches, but our quantum efficiency just went up 10x, and our signal to noise ratio 10x with some new cameras we've designed, and we have a laser that's 10x more powerful. So we expect about a foot from any side. But um, we're, we just got our small animal facility. We just got the pulse lasers. So the signal to noise ratio is increasing by an order of magnitude right now every few months. We're going to release, I think at the end of the year, the images we're getting of the rats and um, rabbits and stuff that we're, we're scanning with the system. Yeah, skull. One of the issues with skull that'll come up, um, you'll probably ask, is can you use ultrasonic on the skull? Well, as I mentioned, we're working with Focus Ultrasound Foundation, which does that. There's a distortion because the, the speed of sound is different in bone than flesh. And so with multiple points, you can correct for that. The question is, what is the focus size that you can reach everywhere? And so we're, we're working on that 
in collaboration with them. And so, yeah, so what we're do, trying to do is replace big, bulky, room size, most expensive room in hospitals, need a power plant and liquid helium with basically a system that we can wear with the same or better resolution that can read and write your bodies. And this is how far we've gotten. And it's totally fun. So thank you for letting me come and talk to you all about it. And we're just trying to make better tools for you all to do um, better research and look forward to collaborations with you all. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. I have a little bit of extra time. If Lisa lets me. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Loved your talk. <laughs> Thanks. I loved your talk, too. So my question is, uh, can you produce uh, um, uh, any uh, contrast materials so that you could do, could see, for example, dopamine uh, neurotransmitters in the brain? Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, I, we can see the differential scattering of neurons because what precedes an electrical pulse going down the spine of a neuron is um, the uh, ionic channels uh, working to, to build up that charge so it can release the pulse. And what happens when the ionic channels change is the the, the membrane roughens. And since we've neutralized the scattering, the de by the descattering the light, we can see the differential scattering at that millisecond heartbeat of neurons. So we can see structural changes. I mean, you can add optogenetics to this, but do you really want to do that in humans? And I know some of it's starting, and, and, and I hear a lot about that. But what are, the, what are the signals for dopamine or amyloid plaques or so forth that we can get to? For sure, because the blood is red, we think it's the better, best signal to noise ratio to start with the first product and then enable um, different contrast agents. Now, I know that right now with MRI, um, gadolinium, there's a, there's a concern about exposure. How many times can you be injected with gadolinium, which is the contrast agent used for MRI and fMRI? And so one question is what I think that we're looking at is what is a safe contrast agent? But as we walk through this, the blood stuff we're doing now. Again, our, our SNR is getting better every few months right now. And then when will it level? It will level off at some point. Sure. It's, uh, we can do that pretty easily. For oxy-deoxy, we really like 720 nanometers and 820 nanometers because that's the maximal, um, that, that changes the absorption. They, the, the absorption is the same at 800 nanometers, and then water starts to absorb. So we've been focused at, at 720 and 820 nanometers for our lasers to start, but we can shift them around pretty easily. I've learned a lot about laser design. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, you know, we'll work on it and work with lots of people. We're trying to enable um, more people to have access to this stuff. Hi. Hi, fantastic talk. Uh, you said that the challenge isn't so much recording at one microsecond, but pulling the data off. And I, I can't quite parse that. What, is, what do you mean? Oh, the traditional uh, issue for camera chips is, is it 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second? If you're going a million frames per second, you can record it. You can buy a camera, the Photron camera. You can buy it, F-P-H-O-T-R-O-N. But it stores it, and then you pull it off later. And so. What's become popular in camera chip design are these double stack systems where there's a recording and then a logic layer so you can do real time image processing of your face or the scene. So like in AR, like when you touch, you sense the scene like in AR or VR, like you really want to touch the table, not have it go an inch below or an inch above. And this is why all this is being developed. I exaggerate only a little. Um, but we can use it for this other thing since that logic stack allows us to decode and pull off one or two numbers to describe that voxel rather than 10 megapix megapixels. So it's just easier and faster just from a signal processing point of view. There's also triple stack. Sony and Samsung have triple stack. So, but most fabs have double stack. 
So when can I buy an attachment for my phone that can do MRI, PET, and ultrasound? Yeah, soon. But why, what's the phone for? <laughs> but yeah, it's leveraging things that ship more than a million units a day. And that's super important um, because there's these extraordinary manufacturing processes. And if you understand how they work, you can design really cool things that are transformative, given that Apple and Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Sony and so forth put all this money into this development for billions of dollars into development for next generation high fidelity virtual reality and augmented reality. I just thought, wow, everybody's working on that. Can we use those billions of dollars for new processes to relook at, you know, and it was a bet. I didn't know if it would work. Um, it's working, <laughs> but you know, you don't know before you jump off the cliff and start the company. It's working pretty well, but uh, it was, it's really just an exploration of can we use that? It, it seems very promising. And five billion people lack access to medical imaging. And yeah, so another question. Thanks, Kenna, for your talk. Uh, would you be able to image uh, dynamic uh, tissues such as venous or arterial blood or fluids like spinal fluid as opposed to static? Flow, uh, yeah, yeah, because we're, we're taking these at a fast clip. Okay. Um, and uh, obviously, there's some ultrasound in there. We can throw in some EEGs. Like, we're for all the imaging modalities. It's just, you know, people are dying. It's expensive. And it's also having something portable can make a tremendous difference in an ambulance or in urgent care, you know, in any rural area. If you're not in, I mean, we're a mile from Mass General right now. There's a line for, but like, in most normal places, you don't have the access to it. So. How can we make it portable? But yeah, we can do flow, yeah. which is, seems important for a lot of diagnosis. Or, you know, you could, like, if you get diagnosed with a BRCA gene, we're thinking, you know, later on, like, could you make, like, a BRCA bra so you don't have to cut off part of your body? So you could just do these, do more sensing more often. Like, you care primarily about three questions. Is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Is it saying the same size? So our training data is the measurement itself. And you know, with an aging population, should we all be scan ourselves, blood, genes, body, you know, once a month if it's so cheap to do it, you know, a blanket or something or something easy and upload that probably in a nonprofit thing with lots of ethics around that. But betting into big data and looking at the changes and what happens should allow us to keep ourselves more healthy. And there, there might be a concern from the medical industry that that would make it less expensive, but we can make it up in volume, <laughs> given that so many, so few people lack access to it. It could be wellness instead of sickness. Okay. It's our vision. Hi. Yeah, I, I was just curious as to what kind of power requirements are needed. If I wanted for, to, exa uh, for example, to monitor the, the length changes of some muscle that's a centimeter below, below the skin, how much laser power is going to be consumed if I want to do this continuously as a kind of sensor? Right. So we, we, that's why we're developing a modular system. The lasers are hard to put together, but we can mosaic the camera chips or the ultrasonic chips. So if you're only interested in, say, silent speech or a certain part, you can just have a, a little patch with a little you know, like a little diode laser kind of thing, probably that size. And so that, that would be less expensive than if you wanted a whole body thing where you'd use a big laser and a mosaic. And it, it's perfect for manufacturing because we're mosaicing the exactly same chip. So Asia Inc. likes to make lots of exactly the same things. So that keeps the cost down. And given that very similar camera chips are shipping in volume in the world's smartphones, we we leverage that. The cost of something is basically related to a single variable, how many ship. So drafting on that can keep the cost down. You asked power. Um, uh, it depends. Well, I mean, like the size of the battery in your cell phone, would that be adequate uh, or do you uh, need something much Yeah, we bigger? think so, although it would be better to be smaller. It's funny, I come from a low power background. I think that we should have zero power devices, but yeah, I love that. <laughs> Apple One, our battery lifetime and cell phones went, has decreased dramatically every year for um, 
since the 90s. But, you know, the functionality has increased. So we have to, you know, one has to decide on that, what that is. Mm -hmm. But Thanks. they're good trade-offs. We're not there yet to make, figuring out the battery size. Mm -hmm. Well oh, one more. Do we have time? No? Okay. Um, I was wondering if the uh, animal work was far enough along that you had some sense of how robust this was to just uh, uh, the normal movements of a body, including pulse in the skin, um, or how much this needed to be characterized, depending on someone's uh, particular skull, just to calculate the ultrasound. Oh, yeah. So given that we can scan that fast, we recalibrate all the time, because if the ski hat moves or something, you know, you... Mm. right. So we just recalibrate and rescan all the time and leverage on, on different points. But yeah, it's an, it's an issue that we have to continue to do. And then you throw out the previous data if you're out of alignment. But it's important. There's a lot of details like that that are super important. But we're like building out the chips right now. So are we done? No, sorry. I'm just trying to keep on time and be a great host. Or, we're good. OK, thank you, everybody.